I was thinking how do I conclude this rather extraordinary morning which has led into the afternoon. And as the debates uh, were raging, I was wondering what I can say. And maybe this is the best way I can express it. History has it that during the Algerian liberation movement, there were a couple of commanders who were sitting, and uh, one of them took five guys and they sat on in, this, in a three-story building. And they were wondering how they were going to defeat the French. And one of them told them, Commander, you, you are very unrealistic. Look, we, there's just the five of us here. Why are you going to get the commanders to defeat the, the French? And this commander stopped a bit and thought. And they said, he invited the other guys, he says, come look at the window. Do you see all those people here? Let's throw them the independence card. Give them the idea and they will get the commanders. And I think also today, that's what we are saying. There are challenges that I have said been uh, facing African research agenda, and the chapter is that emancipation card that we are giving. So what is, it, what is it then about? I think, in my opinion, this is also about self-determination. In terms of research, in terms of the freedom to express ourselves in what it means, what knowledge is and what it means, and I think there are two important things. One is, of course, this is an exercise of democracy in some form, which is really the right of citizens to determine their own choice, their own path of development. On the other hand, it is also about human development, which is the freedom to utilize our capacities. But as it has been discussed here, there is a very interesting and there is a good literature uh, about some call it academic capitalism and knowledge politics. I think there is an article by Atsipas, who is a geographer, who has written extensively about this. The fact that when knowledge is categorized from a certain particular continent, it is less cited, it seems to be less relevant, and therefore it, it is meaning it seems to be less. On the other hand, there is a guy called uh, Rainer Homer who has written about the dominancy of English in publications. To the extent that some of the French journals have been switching and they make it very clear, right? Submissions must be in English. What does this mean to us? Africa is diverse, many languages. And I am bringing this point to bring one element. Yesterday, the Yana Choir was singing about the wind of change blowing across the African continent. And I think we should be asking. Because wind determines takeoff, which direction are we going as a continent? Where is our takeoff? What I think is also very important is that uh, in, in our assessment of knowledge, we need to keep in mind that there are also people who we marginalize as Africans. Let me give an example. Many years ago, when I was a, still a researcher, a young researcher, we used to take students to the northeastern part of Namibia in a park now called Bobata. There is the Sun people, what in the past was called the Bushmen. <coughs> when in one of those visits, the headman there told me 
before you go ahead, can I speak to your students? And he, he had a couple of questions. One was, on this track of the, the, the track, the, uh, the foot, the track of the, of the animal, which animal was this? Was it running or, or walking? Is it injured or not? How long did it pass here? And if we were to track it, how long would it take us to find it? Do you think the best students were able to ask that question? He turned to his own and asked the same questions. Young, young, young teenagers. And they couldn't answer those questions. Then he turned to me. Look at what you have done to us. You told us we must go to school. They didn't manage. All these are dropouts. Now they are back. So whose knowledge are you advancing? If we, we can't cope in your knowledge world, you have disempowered us that we don't have, our young people don't have the knowledge that I have as a daughter to be able to track this animal and find it. So whose knowledge is it? So I think in this chapter, we must also be inward looking, not just thinking about the north or the west. We must think about those, how can I use this chapter to empower those people? The second thing is the role of universities in development. As Ambrina mentioned, in the 50s and 60s, there was a very clear political direction on what universities should do. Uh, development agents. And maybe we have shifted a little bit from that. But we have got to keep in mind that development is based on economically viable knowledge. And as universities, we are the agencies that can foster that. As individuals, we are the agents of that change. And if we are able to apply this charter very well, I think we will make Africa different. We will achieve that dream. The other thing is, one of the things, if you look at the discussions we have had so far, there is a bit of a cry on the continent in that there isn't enough financing, there isn't enough infrastructure. And when I, maybe I didn't clarify, when I cited the issue of electricity yesterday, I really meant that I know in some universities, in Namibia we are lucky that we don't have blackouts and you know, we don't have load shedding. <laughs> but, but if you are in a university, you are running experiments and power goes off, the whole thing is wrong. And for us as a university, even though we don't have load shedding in this country, last week we launched a 3.8 megawatt of production plant from solar. We are doing it because we want to make sure we have clear efforts in terms of reducing carbon emissions and getting more greener in our approach and our practice. Finally, I would say what we have done today is a very important step. And as a continent, we have to make a very serious decisions. And I do believe that it is us. It's one thing to blame the politicians. It's another thing to take responsibility as vice-chancellors 
to cause the developments that we want, to be the change that we want to see. And I want to paraphrase what Bonio wrote in 2002. Basically saying, a continent that allows its universities to decline opts out of development. And I think this charter keeps us on that path of ensuring we are not opting out of development. And this charter and the activities that will come out of it is the long-term political policy strategic direction that we desire. But like it was once said, the story of Buddha, who was approached by two young boys, they asked him, if you are the source of knowledge, what do we have in our hands? Buddha said, it's butterflies. And they told him, you are correct. What color? Said blue, green. You are correct. Are these butterflies dead or alive? And he thought for a moment and said, the answer lies in your hands. You can squeeze it or let them go. And it is up to us to make Africa a continent that will thrive or will starve it. As I conclude, Africa has a, a tradition and a practice of making certain events on the continent where there are gatherings of institutions. We have the Arusha Declaration, we have the Addis Ababa Declaration, we have the Accra Accord and several others. What are we going to call this one? <laughs> I think we can call this the Windhoek 2023. <laughs> I thought you would support me. <laughs> The week, uh, chapter 2023, and I hope my uh, my closing remarks didn't dilute the wonderful debate and presentations that were made. And I really want to express our appreciation to the Privoli Foundation for the support for this. We truly appreciate it, and I wish all of us the best in implementing this chapter. Let's not make it as an academic article that we show and get promotion from but something that's going to change lives. I thank you very much.